Uh, I'd like to introduce Jomi Zamora, speaking on behalf of Sophia Vaughn, Jomi of University of Minnesota, Sophia, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. No, no, no. No? No? University of Minnesota. Okay, just Madison, I'm sorry. Uh, Silva Pastoral Management, exploring soil and water health in central Minnesota. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jomi. Jomi. <laughs> Either one. <too. laughs> Either one. Uh, so I am not Sophia Vaughn, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I am Jomi, and Sophia actually uh, works for me uh, as a graduate uh, research assistant for the project that uh, I am uh, leading. And there's a little bit of modification of the topic that I will be presenting uh, today. Uh, compared to what uh, she just uh, submitted for uh, uh, today. So uh, I will be uh, talking uh, several pastoral management in Minnesota, you know, assessing soil erosion, uh, rate reduction, forest production, animal performance, and uh, potential for uh, adoption in Minnesota. Just, you know, just to break the ice, <laughs> what did mama Cow say to baby cow is pasture better. <laughs> pasture better. <laughs> uh, anyway, it was a, a graphic from the Cattlemen's Association. Uh, so, so essentially, what I will be uh, discussing with you today is just to provide you initial results of the study that we are conducting in Minnesota funded by uh, the Legislative Citizen Commission on Minnesota's uh, Resources, LCCMR, which is a uh, body uh, in Minnesota Congress that provides funding to environment-related uh, research. So, two years ago, uh, we lobbied uh, in this committee in Congress trying to secure uh, some funding to do some research in Minnesota on soil pasture. But during that process, just like what uh, have been experienced in other states, there were some groups that were trying to oppose uh, this idea of you know demonstrating uh, or addressing the unmanaged to the grazing in Minnesota because of the notion that cows in trees do not mix together. So there is still this uh, notion in Minnesota among natural resource professionals that don't bring the cows, uh, bring the cows out from the forest, don't mix them. But the issue is there, so we should really manage it. So the overall goal of this project is to assess the adaptability and merits of civil pastoral uh, system in uh, central Minnesota. Uh, in Minnesota, uh, just like in everybody else, unmarried woodland grazing is just a common uh, problem. In fact, throughout Minnesota, we have almost uh, 700,000 acres of land that are being, of woodlands that are being grazed. In central Minnesota alone, where we are doing uh, the research, uh, we have almost 300,000 acres of land. So the idea is that how are we going to use uh, silver pasture as a tool to uh, address this kind of issues. And what the unmanaged woodland grazing or unmanaged pasture grazing essentially could cause uh, deterioration in riparian areas, we know that it could also lo cause the loss of biodiversity and disruption of uh, ecosystem functions, a lot of negative uh, environmental uh, consequences could occur from unmanaged uh, woodland grazing. It could also be a source for non-point uh, non 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 uh, source pollution such as phosphorus and uh, nitrogen. So we thought that uh, we could educate farmers, producers in Minnesota, as well as natural resource professionals to advocate the use of silver pasture 
uh, among their peers. So that's why we did this research. So the pasture, as we all know, is the intentional integration of trees, livestock, and forests together as one intensive management unit. It incorporates the principles of animal husbandry, uh, forest management, as well as uh, forage uh, management. So we have three uh, research sites in central Minnesota. We have three farmer uh, cooperators. In uh, each farmer cooperators, we set up three uh, systems or three treatments. So each of these farmer cooperators represent the replicates, uh, the replication of our study. So we have set up five acres of open pasture five acres of silvo pasture, and five acres of traditional forest pasture. We did nothing in the traditional forest you know, uh, pasture, but we tried to uh, in, uh, implement all the principles of animal husbandry, uh, forest management, and forage management in the silvo pastoral system. So what we did here is that we tried to uh, cut the area of the trees into a specific uh, basal, basal area. We also try to manage this by putting uh, or by, by introducing seeds, the same process that we did over here in the Selva Pastoral treatment. We seeded native uh, grasses as well as uh, grasses that are familiar or are mostly used by uh, farmers in Minnesota such as clover and uh, timothy. So whatever we did in, in, in this site, we also did it in these two other sites. So this these two sites are located just one mile away from each other, but this is about 30 minutes away from, uh, from these two sites. So this is our uh, silver pasture demonstration trials uh, in Minnesota. So we are assessing the environmental impacts of our experiment, silver pasture, and the different treatments on soil erosion water quality as well as uh, forage quality and the nutritional values of, uh, the forage, of the forages and we also are looking into the effect of money's grazing on species diversity. We are also looking into the economics as well as uh, the quality of the trees that we have uh, in our silvo pastoral uh, system and compared it to the traditional forest pattern. In terms of water quality, we have two uh, sub experiments. We are looking into infiltration uh, as well as the subsurface nutrient transport in all of the treatments that we have the open pasture, the silver pasture, as well as the traditional uh, woodland grazing. We are doing that both in the field as well as in the lab. So what I'm just going to show you actually is just uh, initial result of, uh, of our study. Uh, we have not done quite statistical analysis of this uh, data yet, but we are seeing some, uh, some trend. So for the infiltration part of the study, we used modified Philip II falling head infiltrometer where we did this uh, in fall 2013. That was the time that we were trying that we uh, are, that we were trying to establish our treatments, and we also did it uh, in the spring 2014 and also in fall 2014 which essentially 
coincide with the precedent that was in fall 2013, in, uh, in post-seeding that was in spring 2013, and post-grazing uh, which was done in fall of 2014. So we tried to uh, assess the infiltration rate uh, of this of the soil in case of this treatment to assess the eros, uh, erodibility uh, of these different uh, systems of the soils of the different system. In terms of subsurface uh, nutrient transport, uh, we installed three groundwater wells in its uh, paddock and for 2015 uh, for this growing season we are going to uh, test the water quality using bromide which is a tracer and we are going also to mix it with, uh, with the cow manure to make sure that uh, we are going to be able to evaluate the effects of these different practices on water quality Unfortunately, we don't have any data yet at the moment because last year, my students failed to collect the water sample. So we have to, uh, we have to correct that uh, this year. But we all have a, uh, we have a lab component of this study as well. Uh, we are going to be uh, looking at uh, bromide uh, concentration in the water quality, in the water sample. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is what we did on a lab portion. We dug two soil cores, big one, and that's what we brought in the lab, and that's where we're going to be testing the hydraulic conductivity, looking at uh, uh, the bromide application uh, in this uh, system. But we have not really, uh, they're doing this, this as we speak uh, right now at the lab, so I don't have any information yet to share with you about this one, but these are the things that we are uh, doing. So in terms of vegetation, we are also collecting biomass, assessing the amount of biomass produced in each of the three uh, systems that we have, the silver pasture, the open pasture, as well as uh, the traditional woodland grazing, assessing species diversity using transects, and uh, here is essentially the result that we have with respect to the infiltration rate uh, in our system. I would like to focus on these two sides. I mentioned earlier that we did try to uh, establish baseline information on the infiltration uh, rate potential of this different system. Like, say for instance, in this one, uh, by Steve Mo, fall 2014 was the pre, uh, pre infiltration data, data, and the spring 2014 was uh, coincided with post seeding, and this is the uh, grazing, you know, this is the grazing post, I think it's post grazing period. So, this is the open, or uh, this is the traditional woodland grazing. So when we look at, you know, the infiltration rate of this area in, in, in Mo, say for instance, in this area, in this particular plot, I think Cows were introduced after several years of being idle. But when cows were introduced as part of our study, the infiltration rate potential, the infiltration rate of soil in our uh, system indicates reduction. Meaning that cows activity, not vegetative management, is really causing the you know, infiltration rate reduction in this area. So this is essentially what we are talking to landowners, yeah, uh, what we are uh, discussing with uh, other producers, that if you are going to be introducing your cows in your pasture, most likely it would cause soil erosion, just like what is, uh, what is shown in this, uh, in this graph. 
we have not really quantified yet how is that going to affect uh, water quality, but that is what we are going to do this year. We also tried to look into uh, using, what do you call it? Using ARC, uh, ARC map, ARC GIS. We, for this year, we are going to evaluate whether there is going to be an effect on the infiltration rate uh, potential of these different sites with respect to elevation and with respect to the type of soil uh, present in each of these uh, systems that we have. I try to get more information from my stu from our student Sophia. Unfortunately, she said that she's still working on it, but this is the plan that we are uh, going to have just to understand whether uh, elevation would affect infiltration, so erosion uh, in this uh, in this study. So this is how our systems look uh, right now. This was taken last year, and this is the type of forage growing right now in areas that we did not do. Or uh, any management. This is the this is the traditional urban grazing. We did nothing, and this is the silo pasture we did where we open up the canopy. And this picture or this area from that uh, from this area is just maybe uh, 50 feet away uh, from this other. But we could see that indeed there is really a difference in terms of the amount of. For, uh, forages and possibly the quality of forages present in this area. So uh, I was so happy to see that based on the management that we did, like seeding as well as open, opening up the canopy, we, we were able to show that if you manage this kind of system, you would be able to achieve greater uh, production in terms of forage biomass. And how does that translate into uh, so into the livestock, you know, into the livestock game. But let me just before doing that, I just want to show you this one. Despite the fact that uh, I, I want I want to focus here in mid season, we try to evaluate the biomass production in each of the systems that we have. The open pasture is still exhibited highest biomass production compared to the silvopastoral, uh, silvopastoral system but despite the fact that uh, we have we had higher biomass in the open pasture yet when we look at the livestock gain weight silvopastoral, silvopastoral system compared to the traditional uh, pasture cows in some pastoral system compared to cows grazing in the you know in the open pasture gain more weight. So what I'm just trying to say, to say is that though we have you know significant amount of biomass in the open pasture, but that didn't really translate into uh, uh, into weight gain of the livestock. Possibly it's because of the quality of uh, the forages that we have in here. I would like to uh, focus mostly on crude protein as well as the acid, fi uh, acid detergent fiber which is the acid detergent fiber is the uh, digestibility potential of you know uh, of, this, uh, of this species. So we still have to do some correlation analysis with, with respect to livestock gain and as well as to this uh, forage uh, quality. We hypothesized that when you open up a forest canopy, it would allow lights to penetrate. So therefore, it would trigger the growth of the seeds stored in the seed bag. So therefore, we would expect more species diversity. Based on what we have seen so far uh, on silvopastoral system, uh, we see 
more species uh, in that area compared to other uh, systems that we are looking at. So we are still assessing this and how does species diversity uh, influence animal diversity like, uh, like beer. That is what we are going to be uh, looking at as well in this study. So I'm just gonna, I, uh, I showed, I'm showing some graph here about the survey that we did. It's just like what is happening in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, there's still a lot of uh, ignorance about, about servo pastoral system. Just like what is being presented over here, they are not trying to promote servo pasture uh, among natural resource pro professionals because they don't have uh, knowledge or they lack uh, or they are lacking of technical uh, information or assistance. So there's still a lot of uh, we are still hitting a big wall in Minnesota in order to promote uh, agroforestry in order to promote servo pasture among producers. I think I'm running out of time. Uh, any questions? Yep. Yeah, a couple of questions I had. One was, so the soils were the same across these three farms, is that correct? Uh, they are not the same. Okay, so, so you're taking that into account we are going to take that into account when we took uh, when we take the infiltration. That's why I have the separate analysis yeah. at, the, at, uh, at the moment, but we will do further analysis uh, on that based on some uh, statistical parameters that we really have to use for virus. And the, the breed and age of the, the cows that you're measuring, the breeding on, are they all the same? Yeah, all the same. Okay. Yeah, across the all three sites, up, you know, for the same. I mean, were they the same breed, or did the breed have? They have the breed? same breed. Okay, same breed, but not the same. What about genetic stock? You know, I'm talking, you know, uh, what bull stock and stuff like, you know, the genetic stock, was that similar across? You know, I mean, when you buy semen for, you know, artificial insemination, you pay a lot of money for the right stock. Yeah. And, and you pay a lot more for a bull that has certain characteristics. They may all be the same breed, but they got different characteristics. Is that significant? We have not really looked into that yet, but we have, you know, a livestock guy working on that. And uh, that is something that we are still going to do this year. The challenge about this project is that uh, it takes time to weigh the cows. And they are not really participating. No, <laughs> we just, we just yeah, work yeah. So we have to work with we have to work with the landowner because they know them. Okay, was the weight gains only during the summer months, or were the weight well, gains year with, round? Weight gain during the duration of you know the growing season. Just the growing season. Just the growing season. Because they're feeding hay in this in the winter. They're feeding hay in the, in the winter. Yeah. Okay. They, so what kind of grazing was it? What kind of grazing was it? Was it in, in, you know, intensive rotational or open grazing? So essentially, what we did, we allowed them to graze based on our design. We uh, we, uh, we are using based on our design. We allowed them to graze for one month at a time in its pasture, but we want to make sure that they are not going to starve. So therefore, we have to measure the forages every now and then, so that we will not be able, to, so that we won't piss off the landowner. Otherwise, you know, he will kick us out. So although we have indicated that we are going to allow the, allow them to graze for a month based on our study design, but technically we were not able to do that first because of the amount of uh, forage availability during the grazing period. So we. We graze them in June, take them out in July, allow them to graze again in August. So that's what that's how we did in this experiment. It's a lot in the square design. We need to stop for time, but thank you all. Sure. Thanks, Joe.